Hi, everyone. It's Kevin Raber, and uh, we're back for another Conversations With. And today, I have Peter Eastway with me. Peter Eastway is a photographer from Australia, a good friend. We've done many workshops instructing together, uh, not to mention probably one of the most fabulous photographers out there. Got a great sense of humor. We've had a lot of fun together in life. But today, we're going to talk a little bit about his adventure to Antarctica. And uh, he took a trip to Antarctica a few weeks after my trip uh, this year, before all the things got crazy for me. But uh, what happened to Peter is another story. So we're going to talk a little bit about his trip to Antarctica first, about the photography and the experience. But as the trip moved on, things changed drastically, and uh, it's quite a story. So hi, Peter. It's uh, morning time for you. Uh, you have got your glass there. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just on water for me at the moment. Oh, I have so wine. A little bit earlier. <laughs> So I'll expect the conversation to improve as the night proceeds. Is that correct? Well, well I'm drinking wine, so it only can get better. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, you made the, you made the trip sound um, yeah, perhaps a little bit more exciting than it was. On the other hand, going down to Antarctica at any time is always exciting. I suppose because uh, I did two voyages back to back, and I guess if you said to me, Pete, you can go down for another five days shooting in Antarctica, but on the way back, you've got to spend 30 days in isolation. Is that okay? <laughs> I might not have said yes if I'd known that in advance. But having been, no regrets at all. It was uh, sensational. Antarctica is always special. And you know, I can't almost lose count on how many times I've gone down there. We both love the polar regions. And over the years, and on our trips to these polar regions, uh, and I, I include the Arctic in this, uh, I'm sure you've seen as much change as I have. And you know, this year was more evident than any ever before. The climate change that we talk about a lot, and of course that really hasn't been much discussion on that recently with everything else going on, really is advanced and, and more accelerated in the Antarctica. So what did you see on your trip that way? I guess that um, I knew I was going down in late season, so it was March for me. And so I expected there to be a lot less snow. It's interesting you talk about the snow cover. I remember perhaps my first voyage to South Georgia was in November and it was covered in snow and I just assumed that was what it was like. And then a few years later, I went again in November and there's hardly any snow. I mean, we walked into Kryptikan and it was green grass and this was possibly a week or two weeks earlier than when I'd been before. So I find that the seasons in Antarctica, and I haven't got as much experience as you, but they're very variable. But for me, for March, I was expecting there to be a lot less snow. And I wasn't quite too sure whether I was going to like it or not. I knew I was going to have a good time, don't get me wrong, but I, there's just this little question, you know, so what is it going to be like if there's less snow? But there is plenty of snow. Um, yes, some of the landings were a little bit rockier, but depending where you looked, it was, um, you yeah, know, I, I felt it was fabulous. It's sort of like the end of winter in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, up in the Rockies or whatever. It snowed like anything and then it basically melts away. And for almost the end of summer down there, it's the same sort of thing. The snow had melted away and it revealed the underneath of Antarctica. And so there are places where you get to see the snowpack and all the beautiful textures in the snowpack, which normally would be covered up because there is so much snow there. And so for me, I, I, I feel that I've come away with probably some of my strongest landscape work that I've done down in Antarctica. And I, I, I put it down to the weather and the season. And, and I think that that to a certain extent is just dumb luck. I mean, I've done Antarctica six or seven times, and I think I've had two and a half days of sunshine while I'm there. <laughs> yeah. and that's, that's kind of Antarctica the way it is. What I love doing is putting together books, and because uh, <clears throat> I had 30 days in isolation, I had plenty of time to process my photos and uh, um, <laughs> put them together. And so uh, I'm going to turn this into a, a large um, format book, 420 millimetres square, so that's 840 millimetres across as you see it. And because it's all shot with, uh, well, most of it would be shot with phase one. In fact, I think possibly all of the shots are with phase one, uh, IQ 150, so there's plenty of pixels. So when you're holding the book up to your hand, <clears throat> up to your eyes, you, you, you've got lots and lots of resolution to play with. This was outside of Point Harbour, and um, it's interesting you talked about uh, before, a little bit before we start talking about topaz and how you're able to get rid of the, uh, the grain and the noise. This is shot at ISO 500, so it's not... <clears throat> particularly high ISO, the light was very, very low. There's been quite a lot of work to bring it back up and it does have a little bit of noise about it. 
I actually quite like the noise because it has a, I know it's, I think it suits the subject, but just listening to you talking about Topaz, etc., I was thinking, well, maybe I'll, I'll take the file into Topaz and see whether I can clean it up as well. But I think in terms of the, the light and the grandeur and the emotion, um, you know, we, we, we had it all. We had a lot of uh, passengers sitting down having dinner when this one was shot. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That, you know, there's, there's something about the light in both polar regions, but Antarctica, especially when the light goes down, it almost layers into the clouds and so forth. I just put one or, uh, image up not too long ago on Instagram um, where it just had like the, the foreground, kind of like the shot you just showed with the, the lighting sometimes the way it filters through the layers of clouds, you know, like the top cloud there is lit and then there's darkness and then you've got the, the shoreline lit a little bit and the icebergs have nice light on them. I mean, how do you describe that? I mean, it's so unusual. You can just never see it like this. I think you've hit the nail on the head in that, you know, when we sort of, we live in the middle of the earth, but when you get up to those poles, um, the light, you know, I mean, I guess the sun is coming in across tangentially, depending on how you look at it. But yeah, it's just those weather conditions which are always full of clouds in the atmosphere. And so when the sun does break through in different spots, it really is a matter of having the camera with you all the time. Because it's just, a, you know, you, I, I'm on deck basically the entire time when I'm uh, down in Antarctica because there's always a light show happening somewhere. There's always a surprise. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, on, on the last trip, I took my film uh, guy with me, Michael Durr, and uh, 11 o'clock at night, we had her enjoying things. It was pitch dark out, and I always walk around the ship one time before bed, you know, just walk around. And we walked around, and we hear this, I said, there's a whale coming. And sure enough, we stood out there, leaned on the balcony, and within 20 feet of the ship, we passed a humpback and a calf. And I was like, we're the only ones seeing it. You know, yeah. the humpback yeah. and then the two of us, nobody else on the ship knew about it. And, you know, it's those magic moments, even when there isn't light, and even when you don't have a camera, that just makes these trips so incredible. It is the challenge, isn't it? Shipboard life can become quite addictive in that, oh, it's happy hour, so it's time to go and have a cocktail. And I'm just saying this, Kevin, because I'm, I'm wanting to share the fact that I, I am human. Um, I was on a voyage a couple of, uh, a year or so ago, and one of the things I've always wanted to get was those lenticular clouds up over South Georgia. Yep. And I, I just you know, really wanted to get them. Anyway, one afternoon we came in <clears throat> and they had some wonderful cocktails. And normally I have half a glass and I'm anybody's, a whole glass, I'm everybody's. Um, and I had two cocktails this night. And so by nine o'clock I went to bed because I was done. And that night they had the most amazing lenticular clouds and I slept through it and missed out on the whole lot. So this last voyage, I made sure that I had no more than one cocktail and then I stayed awake just in case. <laughs> yeah, I, I always told the guy at the helm, you know, I get to, you get to know the guys up on the bridge and I said, here's my cabin number. If shit changes, you know, I don't care, whatever time of night it is, call me. And, you know. I'd, I'd get a call into the cabin and then, you know, I could decide too whether we wanted to wake the rest of the the attendees if the shot was good. But, you know, I, I had a lot of other eyes watching for me sometimes, you know. And I think that's possibly one of the advantages of going down in March or the late season is that we actually had sunrise and sunset. Whereas a lot of the time when you go down sort of, you know, towards the middle of the year, certainly around the December period, you know, the sun doesn't set. Um, or it might just go a little bit twilight, etc. But you, I mean, that can be wonderful in itself, but just having the real periods of darkness, um, and I mean, the, the sunrises and you know, the twilights were very, very long, of course. Um, but, you know, geez, there's just some fantastic opportunities just to, to, uh, to shoot, which I possibly hadn't experienced before. If you're going down late season March, the downside is you might not see as many penguins, for instance. So, I mean, a lot of the places where you normally see 40, 50,000 penguins, there might have been one or 2,000 penguins left, if, if any. And so that is quite a remarkable difference when you, when you pick what part of the season that you go to visit in. So talk, talk about this picture that you're showing, quite, quite cool. This is part of the, the climate change, isn't it? Yeah, you see, Kevin, look, I, I am definitely a, a climate change believer, um, but I'm just not 100% sure about how much of this is there every season and, and not. I mean, it, it's definitely barren here. I think this is what you were talking about, where normally we would get off. You, know, you can see over here the vestiges of snow. Normally this is all covered in snow. So 
is this just the season that we happen to have this year or is it like this all the time? And I mean, I know that when you talk to the scientists, there's no doubt that the snowpack is melting and things are changing. Uh, I was on board ship with Ian Goodwin, who's a, a professor here in glaciology. I, funnily enough, I discovered I'd been to school with him 40 years ago. And we hadn't seen each other for 40 years and then suddenly we we're on the ship and he was a Zodiac driver. You know, he's a professor and a Zodiac driver. He just wanted to get to South Georgia. So he, he signed up to come down as a, as a guest lecturer as well. And, you know, he talked all about climate change. And, you know, when, when, he, when the scientists sit down and put forward what they have seen and what they've observed, it's hard to argue that we are experiencing climate change. Whether we can change it or not, and what we can do, they're the, they're the big questions that we've got to try and answer. If we're going to leave our kids anything, that's, that's for sure. I'm not a denier. I just don't know whether I'm smart enough to know whether this is normal or whether it is a, a sign of, of global warming. From my point of view on our trip, um, it wasn't what I would call normal, having been to many places uh, numerous times. I've never seen them so bare as we saw them this year. And, and like you're discovering, it lent itself in that way to some more interesting photographs because you're just not shooting a lot of white snow with texture on it. That part of, there's, there was a reveal going on for lack of better words, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. So this, um, just, just uh, one of the cool little things just for the, a, a, a throwaway line, I'm using the exposure averaging on the, uh, the phase. Um, the Olympus cameras have also got exposure averaging. So no ND filter. It's a, I think it's an 80th of a second or something like that, but I've just let it run for a minute and that's blurred out. I mean, the water was pretty smooth in the foreground already, but it just really has created a, a beautiful sheen there. So uh, not shot from the Zodiac, not shot from the, uh, the ship, but that was when I was on terra firma with a tripod. <laughs> Very nice shot. Love, love the way the water just has that, that magic to it. It's very nice. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know about you, but uh, Port Charcot, this is uh, we, we landed here. I, uh, we went a couple of times. On this particular occasion, there wasn't any snow around, but then a little bit later, it just changed. And so that's like uh, half an hour later and suddenly the, the weather changes. And I think that for me, it doesn't really matter what time of the year you go, the weather just changes so quickly that it can be no snow one minute and lots of snow the next. Um, and just being out in these sort of like, um, conditions, I, I just love it. I mean, <clears throat> when you're at home, um, you normally don't go out for a walk in the rain because you know you're going to get wet. When you're <laughs> down in Antarctica, you know, you're off on the Zodiac, you're on shore for a couple of hours and stuff happens, then you're stuck there in those, those weather conditions. And I just love that because it's something that you know, we probably don't do enough of as we get older because we think we get smarter. I don't know if that's right or not. I don't know if we ever get smarter because it seems it <laughs> goes the opposite direction sometimes, but there's nothing like photographing a scene where now with the cameras that we have that we can actually you know, keep track of the snow. There's a shot that I'm talking about. You actually had snow there. Yep, so you had snow there. We had completely no snow. It was all rock. And down here on the left, I put my camera bag and I was walking around the, the boat and I got a photo taken from the other side looking back. Oh, here we go. Oh, your yeah. camera bag in the picture? Yeah, I left it here and I processed the photos and because it looked much the same shape as a whole lot of the rocks, I didn't see it. And I, I posted these photos up on my website <coughs> and uh, Gary Richardson, one of the photographers has been with me before, he, he sent me a little personal message and said, so Peter, were you doing some advertising for a camera bag or something this time? <laughs> were you? Ah, it's, anyway, it's not there now, I've removed it. <laughs> But uh, no, the, these, uh, the, these water boats are just fantastic. And every time I go, I, I just get drawn to, I, I photograph the same things many, many times, but the light is different. The snowpack is different. There's a certain, yeah, the, the, the boats have degraded more. Um, the ones on uh, Deception Island, <clears throat> I just love the water boats there. Again, we had another example where, you know, it was a little bit overcast and stormy. The, the sun would come and go a little bit. And then we had a snow shower. And so we're shooting like this and it's just beautiful conditions for photography. And my first voyage, it was completely uh, snow free as well. But the second time we had all of this snow. Uh, yeah, look, look at that, it was just, just beautiful. Oh, that place is so gorgeous. And um, you know, the, the shoreline is always steamy because of the, the geothermals there and everything too. And I think a lot of the snow melts quickly there because it's such a warm place, I mean, 
um, you know, you dig down one foot and, you know, you got steam coming up. It's such a geothermal, you're right in a volcano there. They vacated it. What was it, 1910s or 1920s? I forget. Um, I should pay attention to the, uh, the history lecturers on board a little bit better. But uh, um, there, there are a whole lot of people that evacuated because it was getting decidedly warm. Yes. Yeah, very, very warm. I love the whale tanks there, the rush, the rust, you know, I'm a rustaholic, and so. They're fantastic. It's funny, when, when I land at Deception Island, you can either go left and do all the old buildings and the rust, or you can go right, and you know, I walked up to, uh, what is it, Neptune's window up yeah, here. Yeah, Neptune's window. Um, and that, that's always a, a great view as well, and, and, and past the water boats. So, so a lot of fun, a wonderful spot. Oh, great spot. That's we're during the snow storm, and this is just a little bit before. Uh, just uh, the, the shapes and the patterns in there, I, I just find it such a, a stark landscape. You know, a, a, an almost lunar landscape, isn't it? Not that I've been to the moon, Kevin. When are we going to do a workshop up to the moon, do you reckon? Not too long. If, if Musk has, Elon Musk has his way, we might be going to the moon pretty soon. Wouldn't that be fun? I uh, hear he's a personal friend of yours. He's uh, inviting you up with the camera. Is that right? Yeah, we'll see how good that works. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, God, you know, Peter, your your work is always so stunning. Um, did now, of course, what you, you you didn't do a flyover; you did a sail. So when we go, because of weight limits, a lot of times we we don't take tripods, and we'll take an extra lens or two. Uh, so you had your tripod with you for a lot of this, right? Yeah, I, I did fly in, um, and that was a real problem. In fact, I, I made a little note to myself that um, fl flying in has got an advantage and perhaps a disadvantage. When you fly in you suddenly bang into Antarctica and it's go, go, go. And I felt a little bit disorientated when I got there the first time because, you know, the minute you're on the ship, you're shooting because it's all happening. Whereas when you leave Ushuaia and you sail down, you've got two or three days to, to get your gear ready, sort of get into the swing of things and then you see you know, Antarctica on the rise and it gets closer and closer. There's this anticipation. So I can understand why people might like to fly across the Drake because it gets a little bit bumpy from time to time. Yeah, bumpy. But on the other hand, that expedition feeling of, you know, sailing there and sailing back, I, I still like that. I've got to say, I, I still like it. And I can take as much gear as I like because that is a problem when you fly in. You can't take as much gear. I, hadn't, I, I was walking around the deck nude, Kevin, because I couldn't put any clothes in my bags because I'd, I'd run out of weight. I had to put all my cameras in. I had no clothing. I was just running around completely naked. That's probably a little, you know, TMI for us, but that would have been quite the picture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this that it's um, there is. I mean, I I I don't have a seasickness problem. All these trips I've done, and you know, across the Drake, sometimes the, the waves are actually taller than the bridge, and you know, you'd look sideways out the window and see the wave. Um, so I was one of the fortunate ones, but for many people, that's a very miserable trip. You know, if you can do it, it's wonderful. So. The only way I've been doing that recently is when I do my South Georgia trips, and we we sail from Ushuaia to South Georgia, South Georgia to Antarctica, and then back to Ushuaia. That's a twenty day trip. Yeah, uh, that's a, I love the light playing on that. Look at that. That's beautiful. Well, actually, uh, I mentioned Ian before. He's just up there in the top right hand corner, walking down, and uh, this is uh, Nico Harbour. And I was doing a Zodiac cruise with a, a group of photographers. And Ian was walking up just to check for crevasses and you know, make sure it was safe for the passengers to go for a walk later on. And um, as he was walking down, I could see him approaching this triangle of light. So I just waited for him to get into position. And then I shot him. I got, you know, got 10 shots as, as he's walking down. And then I got on the radio to him. I said, Ian, can you wave? And so he stopped down here and he's turned around and waved to the camera. So we, we've got that as well. But that, that, that's the advertising shot. I, I like the fact that he's, he's sort of hidden and um, you, you look at the photo and you, 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 you have to investigate it. You've got to discover it. Well, that's, that's something that when a photograph stops you and you can immerse yourself into it as a print, that would be a great print because that would be one of those, you know, look at it far away and keep walking into you immerse yourself into the image and, you know, see what, what's going on there. Um, and Nico Harbor, that's Nico Harbor, right? Yeah, that's Nico Harbor. Yeah. Did you know I got married there on the beach? Ah, there you go. Well, there wasn't a beach this time. It was all rocks. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it was all rocks too, but it was a, <laughs> a very rocky beach, but it was, uh, yeah, it brings back a lot of memories for me. We, um, we had the whole ship chartered, and so we had 60-some-odd people at, at the wedding, and they were all photographers, so we were very well covered, but it was so much fun. <laughs> And uh, as soon as we were done, 
you know, that glacier that's up in the back, you know, as yeah. you're looking. As soon as we were done and the captain of the ship who was marrying us goes, they now pronounce your man and wife, the whole thing calved and avalanched. It oh, was, is that right? Oh, my God. It was just, a, you know, a huge explosion, and then you just watched it come down. So it's all on film, and it was really cool. <laughs> Love that place, man. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Mother, Mother Nature looking after you. So often when I do my edits, you know, I have what I think is the perfect edit for the photo, but then if I'm going to put it into the context of a book or even an audio visual, I will often crop again just to make sure that there's a sure, sure. cohesiveness in the, the way the, the photos flow from one to the other as you go from page to page. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a defining picture there. That says it all. So, you know, shot in the sort of the middle of the day down there, Kevin. So you know, you don't, uh, don't just pull your camera out at sunrise and sunset. It happens all the time. It's, it's quite remarkable, isn't it? Yep. Very nice. I think that's near the, I think that either the Seven Sisters or the Six Sisters are to the right, or this is the beginning of them. It's around that area. I, I'm, I'm sort of getting a little bit better with my geography down <laughs> there, but um, I still get completely lost. And in fact, in this book, I've said I haven't provided any, any place names because <clears throat> if we went back to this location, it wouldn't look like that. It doesn't matter how many times I go to a location, they never look the same. It's no. always different. And so what does it matter where it is? If somebody goes there, they're not necessarily going to experience it like this anyway. So the Le Mer Channel? Uh, we went through in fog and snow. It was so foggy, you couldn't see 50 feet in front of you. Uh, we had some uh, wonderful uh, light going through the Le Mer. Just looking back as we're going in. Always good to look over your shoulder and look oh, back the other way. that place, yeah, it's a short trip, but... It's just stunning what, what you see. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. I've got, this, I've got one photo, it's not in here. We were in, in the fog and the cloud and then we were looking out into the distance like we are here, it's about looking the other way. And I just haven't quite resolved the image yet, but it's just one of those wonderful shots. I, I, it sort of feels like a, a Tolkien landscape, which I use perhaps as a descriptor too many times, but it just really is very nice. So it's one of those, you know, we come away sometimes with photos that I know that I've got to process better in the future. I've got the shot, it's sharp, but I just haven't got the exposure and the tonality uh, quite right. Paradise um, Harbour. Nice cloud formations you had too. You're very lucky on that, on your trip. Very it nice. Worked. And in fact, I've got a few other shots taken in Paradise on the previous voyage. So this is Paradise as well, where there's a lot of low cloud and, um, you know, like you can just make up in the left mm -hmm. up here that's the top of the mountain behind that we saw before. And yep. so, I, you know, again, the weather just makes such a change. Oh, it does. The experience, it just, you know, you go back, I, you know, I've been to paradise probably each time I've been to Antarctica. It's the place we, you know, everybody has to go to and uh, different every time. Although I've got to say the shape of this, the front of the glacier here always reminds me of <clears throat> one of the, uh, the walls of uh, Mordor in uh, the in Lord of the Rings. Uh, I just love the texture. That place in uh, Plano, Bay, Plano Bay is like my favorites. So this is coming out of the Le Mer, <clears throat> game sunset. So we uh, just 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 lucky to be there at the right time. And that's the uh, that was a morning on a, on a return voyage. I don't know. There's something just about that the starkness of it. It's it's quite a simple shot in many ways, but I don't know just the black and the white on the on the rock facade, a little bit of color behind it. It just um, just spoke to me, I guess. It has a tendency to do that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Hard to, hard to take a bad shot down there. A lot of people go, why do you keep going back to Antarctica? And um, I don't know how yeah, you question, feel. Kevin, sorry. Why wouldn't you keep going back to Antarctica? Sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's the, well, one of the things that I love the most is that it really is one of the only places on Earth that it's a dynamic landscape. Like that photograph there, you could go there now and it would be totally different. So... You know, it's not like you're planting your tripod holes at all the same places we do in, say, the Northern Hemisphere or elsewhere, you know, taking iconic shots. There is no iconic shot. There is no place that you would go here and just say, I want to, you know, shoot this because it was, it's famous. You know, the whole place is a dynamic, changing, evolving landscape. That, and, you know, photographs can be made almost anywhere. It's there's no place on earth like it. That's, I mean, and then you throw, throw the wildlife in on top of it and it goes crazy. So this is Nico Harbour. So the photo before with the little, you know, with uh, Ian in the landscape, the slither of light. So he was standing up along here somewhere yeah. and I was shooting from over there. And this is obviously where you got married. Kevin. Right down there. That's it. And 
a lot of times we'd make a slide on the right hand side, like right where the divide of the, the page is. Yes. The expedition teams would make a slide. So, you know, you kind of climb up and go to the left, and there's That's a really right. beautiful oh, overlook. Yeah. Yep, right yeah. about there. And then you can come down and, you know, you can, you know, put your butt down and you slide down the whole damn thing. And it's such an experience. So cool. Well, the first time I went here, we were up the top. I think it's over here. Is it down here? I forget where. But the scale always gets me. Maybe it's over here because there's not so much snow. Might have only been a short walk. I forget. But the catabatic winds coming off the glacier over to the left out of the picture were so strong, I had to sit down on my bum to get back down to the beach because... Yeah. We just felt that we we're going to be blown straight off and over the edge here, which was a real worry. So, uh, yeah, it, yeah, there's, there's nothing, definitely not short of excitement down there. We walked up, and from up here somewhere, we're looking over to the right here um, a little bit later, and that's the view that we got. So there's a little bit of thunderstorms up above happening, a little bit of light coming through, all of the glaciers in there. And I just look at that, I, you know, I think that's possibly my most quintessentially Antarctic photo to date. I think that's epic, man. That is just epic. Have you thought of doing that in black and white? That would be such a... It would be good in black and white, wouldn't it? What a yeah. dynamic shot. Holy cow. So this this mountain here, that, this is shot maybe, I don't know, 10 o'clock. Um, at 6 o'clock in the morning, um, that's what I was shooting in the same thing. Mm, very, very cool. So nobody, at this point on the trip, you're, everybody's healthy still and you are not don't have any issues, right? So I had two voyages down to Antarctica. One left on the 3rd of March. And then we came and we flew in. Um, we came back to Ushuaia on the fifth, on the fourteenth, fifteenth, you know, fourteenth of March. We heard that the pandemic had been that World Health Organization had declared a pandemic on the eleventh of March. I mean, we obviously knew that while we were down there. And the question was, do we sail or don't we sail? And we were given the option not to. A couple of the crew, um, expedition crew, who had perhaps health issues. And they, you know, because we, we didn't really know an awful lot about COVID-19 at that stage, but we heard that you could get respiratory problems. So there are a couple of people who got asthma and they thought, well, it's probably not good to be on the ship if that happens. And so we were given the opportunity to get off. Um, and I looked at it and I thought, well, um, I, I had some photographers coming with me, so it wasn't a good show for me not to go in the first place. But I, I really sat down and I thought, you know, all of this is going to be over in a couple of weeks. Um, if we stay here now, all of the flights leaving Ushuaia are already fully booked with the passengers who have arrived. So if there are going to be another 100 odd passengers trying to get a flight, I might not get out for two or three days anyway. Argentina is going to close its borders, they reckon, or close the airports in two or three days. I might be stuck in Ushuaia. I might as well be stuck on a ship as stuck in Ushuaia. So I thought, by the time we get back, we'll go. So we left. <laughs> and um, I think... You know, it, it wasn't something that we didn't think about carefully. Some of the other ships that were in port didn't leave. They decided not to go. Um, but I, yeah, I, yeah, obviously in hindsight, we, we possibly shouldn't have gone. On the other hand, I got some great photos down there. Yeah, you know, we had five or six days in Antarctica, which was sensational. But on, I think it was the seventh or the eighth day, one of the passengers had a fever. So they were put into quarantine. So we'd, we had five cabins down on deck three up the front, which had been created for isolation should something like this happen. And <clears throat> so they were, you know, there was a husband and a wife. The wife had a fever. So the two of them were put into isolation. And um, the whole ship basically then went into lockdown because the, the doctor said, we don't know whether it is or it isn't, but we have no choice. We've got to assume that it is. So we basically were in our cabins from that day onwards. So you're, you're in isolation or, or lockdown now, right? So, yeah, so it's cool. Yeah, so all of the passengers, we, you weren't allowed to leave your cabin. And the, the ship's crew, they would deliver meals and they would leave the meal outside the door, knock on the door and then walk away so that when you opened up, <clears throat> you wouldn't contaminate them or anything like that. Um, I think, though, that by the time we all went into isolation, the damage had been done because you can have COVID for four or five days before you show any symptoms, and during that time, you're infectious. So if someone had come on board the ship right at the beginning, which is obviously what happened, we all got infected at that stage, I'm pretty sure. But we didn't know it at that stage. So we're just playing the game. I was, you know, you know I'd be talking to other people on the phone, and I say, look, there's no way that this can be COVID. We've all done the temperature tests. No, you know, everybody's 
um, hasn't been to China or to Japan or wherever the hotspots were. You now everything's got to be fine. It's just a, a general ship flu that we've got. <clears throat> when we actually got tested, um, you know, probably two weeks or so later, gave us some quick tests and we were all negative. And then they gave, came on a couple of days later and did a more in-depth test. And they discovered that 70% of the ship had COVID-19. So the doctor was 100% correct in doing what he did, uh, isolating us, doing it by the book. He did everything correctly. Um, not that he knew, but uh, in the end, uh, the doctor came down with it as well. So he was in hospital in Uruguay and, and recovered fully, which is great. So <clears throat> COVID-19 definitely was an issue for us. Uh, we had a couple of passengers that were in ICU, and I think one of them may still be in ICU at the moment, and, and they're still in um, Montevideo. And so we look around the world, and it's not something that we take lightly. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think you really could have known when we left. You know, based on the knowledge we had, we really felt that we'd done everything and that we would be clear. Now that we've looked at how it's actually happened in hindsight, maybe we were a little bit optimistic. Yeah, it's, it was it was so hard to tell back then. You know, we had a president that said, "Well, you know, there's only six six infections, and you know, it's just going to go away like magic." And you know, nobody really knew. So it it turned out to be, you know, obviously for the whole world, something you know considerably different. So now, normally you would go back to Ushuaia. Your ship did not go back to Ushuaia, or did you? Well, we well. There are a whole lot of legalities involved, but essentially we hadn't left Argentinian waters, so I'm told, and this might not be right. So we thought we'd be able to get back into Ushuaia. However, there's no point in getting back in, into Ushuaia because there wouldn't have been any planes to get us back home. So the thought was that we would go to Stanley on the Falklands. But as we were coming towards Stanley, because we had a possibility of fever and possibility of COVID on board, Stanley didn't have any medical facilities to look after us if there was a problem. So we had went further. Couldn't go to VA because VA had closed its, um, the, uh, the harbour. So we went and basically uh, camped off the coast of um, Montevideo. So we were you know, 12 nautical miles away. You could just see the, uh, the city on the, on the horizon. And we bounced around there for, well, I guess, 10 days, 12 days or something like that. I mean, time sort of gets a little bit blurry now. We were there for quite some time. And so the Uruguay government was saying, well, we don't know how you are either. We're not quite too sure. We need to do some tests. And they were looking after their population and doing everything. We had no problem with that. We understood it. Um, then when we did have someone who became quite sick, they were the first to say, right, oh, we'll get them into hospital. And they sent a, a, a little ship out, a little boat out to pick up our passenger and take them off. So the Uruguayan government was fantastic in every way. They really looked after us, but they also looked after their population. They I think they, they treated both sides of the equation very, very well. Has the air flights have all been locked down at this point now? Are we at that point where uh, international travel stopped or did you start? Yeah, so at that time there weren't very many flights. Um, they were looking, at, well, at, at one stage there was the possibility of there being some Australian Air Force planes coming over and picking us up and taking us home. On, on the ship, 90% um, 90, 90 or more were Australian New Zealand and 10% were other nationalities. So to get the majority of the passengers off to go to one country was made that side of it easier. Um, but we still had passengers to get back to Europe, America, et cetera, as well. Um, and so they, they left a few days later, as it turned out. So we had all sorts of different um, scenarios, but of course, as the, as the passengers, we didn't really know. All we were told was that we're working on it. We're working on it. So the, the shipping company, Aurora, they did their best. I mean, it was new, um, yeah, completely uncharted waters for them, so to speak. And they basically just, you know, they were being given the run around as much as we were. So it was just a matter of negotiating. The governments got involved and eventually um, we had a, a safety corridor which took us directly from the ship to the plane. But we weren't allowed to get off the ship until the plane was already landed. So there's no doubt that we would be able to get from the ship to the plane. And then we had a most fantastic cavalcade. Uh, they put us all into um, buses. We all had our masks on and everything like that. And then they had um, police um, bikes. They had ambulances, flashing lights. They cordoned off all the roads and we had a cavalcade. I felt like one of the, I felt like um, Donald Trump as he's you know, driving through all of the city, <laughs> you know. It was fantastic. 
you know, I, I said to one of the uh, uh, passengers, I said, oh, this is something that money can't buy. And uh, that, that's true. But I don't know whether I want to go through the experience just to have that. But anyway, by the by, it was a lot of fun. And then we were on a, a specially chartered medical plane. Um, the people who were positive were up the back. The people who were negative were up the front. They had, um, the, the plane was segmented off so that, you know, the air wouldn't go through between the front and the back. I'm not too sure how effective that was or wasn't, as I think a few of the negative people ended up being positive. But that could have happened while they're on the ship. Who, who knows what yeah. it was. But that was exciting um, until we came back to Australia. And then, so first off, to this point, you've been testing, you've had a couple tests or? So at that point I had tested in, I, I was tested by the Uruguayan government and I tested positive. You tested positive, but asymptomatic. No, I had light symptoms. Um, so the reason that I was in isolation a little longer than some of the other crew was because I had a little bit of a headache and I just, because we weren't quite sure, I went down to the doctor and I said, just check my temperature. So he got the, um, the air temperature thing and he put it on my forehead. He said, no, you're fine. He said, but you don't look 100, do you? And I said, I'm just not quite there. So then he did a, a, a temperature in my ear and he said, oh no, you do have a fever. Well, I was 37.4, so it wasn't really that much. I had a light headache and that was it. And by the evening I was fine. But because I had had the fever, that was it. I was in isolation for the next 14 days at least. Wow. And then when we got into Montevideo, <clears throat> Eventually, I was tested, and that was shown that I was still positive at that stage. When I got to Australia, I, I, they tested me again, and then I was negative. So uh, that's um, weird. So, did you have the one where they stuck the thing up your nose? And yes, I had that both times. Yes, isn't isn't that the most unpleasant thing? I mean, at least it only lasts a few seconds. I've I've had it done. Yeah, like your face goes like this. <laughs> oh my god, you were one of the lucky ones. So so you tested positive, but you really didn't have a lot of the symptoms. Um, I, and I think if, if we say there are 100 people on the ship, um, you know, we had three that went to the hospital, two very, very serious, but the other 90, 95 really were either asymptomatic or had very mild symptoms. That's my understanding. Of course, in isolation, I'm not the doctor. There might have been more people that had problems that I'm aware of, but all of the people that I spoke to, all of the crew or the expedition crew that I was with, we were essentially mild symptoms or asymptomatic. A number of the crew remember that the food didn't taste so good for a while, but that's because you lose your you lose taste. your taste of smell that's and one taste. Of the symptoms. So that they, that's why they figured we must have had it because the food went off, and really the chef was still doing a great job. You know, it's easy for someone like me who had next to no problems at all to say, "Oh, it's okay." But you know, I know that there are a couple of passengers who definitely suffered very badly from it. So it is something that we do need to take very seriously. You know, I, I just wonder if we don't get the vaccine, what is it going to be like going forward? So, I mean, you know, we really do need a vaccine. Sure. It's interesting that your government at the moment seems to be so positive about getting a vaccine, uh, whereas experts in Australia are saying the likelihood of a vaccine is not high. Uh, they're suggesting we don't bank on a vaccine and that we that this is life going forward. So, yeah, there's so much information out there. Little individuals like you and me probably struggle to work out what's what's really happening. Uh, it's, it's even worse here because you just don't know what to believe and who to believe. I mean, uh, you know, what are you saying? You go go and get some uh, floor cleaner and uh, gargle with floor yeah, cleaner. Or it's like, like that. Come on, where's this come from? Oh, uh, anyway, so now you 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 get back to Australia. You've had a flight, which was you know, that's a rather long flight, it's at least sixteen or seventeen hours, isn't it? Um, sixteen hours back to Melbourne, and so I live in Sydney, but the plane went to Melbourne. And now you go to Melbourne and they, 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 they once again uh, put you in custody and take you where? So we got taken to a hotel. And again, I don't know the facts, but what I hear is that a number of the hotels in Melbourne didn't want to have us because we were all COVID positive. Not all of us, but a lot of us were. And there's so much misinformation about well, what does that mean? And it's sort of, it was almost like we had the kiss of death because we were COVID positive. But as I said, you know, 90, 95%, you're asymptomatic. It's not a big drama. So the hotels were thinking, well, we don't want all of these sick people. We won't take you. But there was one hotel which said, no, no, no problem. This hotel, I believe, is marked for demolition. The <laughs> building next to it was being demolished. And I was lucky because the room I was in, I had a nice view over a park. But a number of the other passengers, they had a view over the demolition site. And so for half of their time, it was boom, 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 <laughs> all day as they were pulling down the building next to it. So anyway, we, we were taken into a hotel. Mine was comfortable. 
it was clean enough. But obviously it was an old hotel because I heard on the grapevine that some of the rooms were mouldy, there wasn't carpet on the floors and all this sort of stuff. But then again, first world problem, you know, we're, we're alive, we're good and all that sort of stuff. Everybody reacts to things differently. And when I was in isolation, I had no trouble. I, I had things to do. I mean, when I got back to Australia, I had the phone, the internet. I was basically working for the two weeks I was here anyway. <clears throat> on board ship, I had the photos to do, the books to design, made videos, all that. So I'm quite self-contained. Other people, though, uh, possibly don't take isolation so well. And I heard on the grapevine that the group of people that were in the hotel before us, there was a person, that, uh, there's a guest there who had either tried to commit suicide or had because they couldn't handle the isolation. Because when they took us for walks, we would have, like they took us for a walk up on the top floor of the hotel, not outside, just on the top floor. So you, there's a little, a small little lap pool and you could walk around the pool and that was it. And they had four guards there to stop us from jumping off the hotel. <laughs> And I mean, you know, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, what a waste of bloody money. But then I hear that they actually had issues. You know, one of the guards said, you know, we had, you know, we had, a, we had a death here a couple of weeks ago. And suddenly I felt a bit bad because I'm making light of the fact there are all these guards everywhere, but they actually had someone who had a real problem. And so now I get it. You know, that's why we, we, we had guards outside our room 24-7 to make sure that we didn't get out. Did you have doctor visits at all? So they checked in? Well, in, in, <laughs> that, that's an interesting thing. Yes, we were supposed to be assessed daily by a doctor, but no doctor wanted to visit us because we were potentially COVID positive and they didn't want to get it. So I saw one medical person once, a, a nurse, and that was when she tested me and I tested negative. So in theory, I've been on ship, I've tested positive, I've come back to Australia, I'm now negative. I'm no longer a threat to anyone. And when you look at the paperwork that the Victorian government gave us, the state of Victoria in Australia, they gave us a piece of paper that said, under Section 200, we're going to detain you, no trouble. And then subsection 5 said, we will assess you every 24 hours. So they rang us up every 24 hours and said, how are you? That was the assessment. Then it says, if you are no longer a risk to society, uh, you know, for, on health basis, or maybe on the risk to society in many other ways, who knows, uh, we will let you go. So since I've tested positive after the third day, I'm no longer a risk. They would have to let, they in theory, in theory had to let me go because um, that's what it says, subsection five. But of course, if I'd been let go and then I went to the media and said, hi, I was on the ship, I've come in and after three days they've let me out, everybody in the public would have been going, oh no, we've got COVID positive people. So what they did was they said, we know that we know that the Uruguayan government has tested you and that you've got a result, but we're very careful in Australia and we're not going to accept those positive results. We're going to treat you as unknown. And that did two things. One, it meant they could keep us there for two weeks. And two, it meant the Victorian government didn't have a spike of 70 more po positive yeah, yeah, yeah. people in the country. So I think it was a political thing. Am I bitter about it? No. Every time somebody rang me up, I told them that I was a lawyer and had they read subsection five and we had a good laugh about it. But I get why the government did it. And I, yeah, I understand. If that's what we have to do, that's what we have to do. So not bitter. I had a good time in uh, isolation. I got a lot of stuff done. I even updated a whole lot of videos for my, <clears throat> my landscape photography masterclass. I'm always meant to add in a series of videos based on some PowerPoint presentations that I did. And that's been an idea for two or three years, Kevin. I've just never got around to it. I'm always <laughs> doing a photo tour with you or something like that. So now I'm stuck in this hotel room. So I rang up uh, Rob Gatto from KL and he delivered a nice microphone. I had my Fuji XT and my, my tripod, beautiful window light. It's south facing down there, which in the southern hemisphere um, meant that you know I had nice indirect light. And I did those videos. And they're all up on the website now. Eight videos all done, part of the masterclass. I was productive. I had a great time in isolation. You know, it's so different here. Um, the, the countries that have that kind of, you know, if that's what the, they say we have to do, we'll just do it and we'll take one for the team. You know, and, and here they're protesting at state capitals wanting to, you know, say you can't detain us, you got to open up things again and so forth. And um, Hearing your experience, I mean, I, I didn't know how serious COVID-19 was, but when I had... Um, a bit of a headache, I thought I should go and see the doctor because if I'm positive, um, I was delivering meals to the passengers, I don't want to be passing it around. So I was a little bit worried. And then 
you know, and so I, I just wanted to make sure that I did the right thing. And then, of course, during that period of time, I'm thinking, geez, that was a bit silly. I'm stuck in bloody isolation for 16 days. Why did I do it? But then I've come back and I've heard about your personal experience. And I would feel terrible if I had added to that to some other family in some way because I hadn't done the right thing. And so I don't get a lot of the people who won't play the game, who won't do the isolation because they think, oh, my business is falling down or whatever. If you're dead, you don't have a business. You know what I mean? And yeah. if, if it's not you, it could be someone that you know and love that, that falls to this. So I, I, I sort of, I, I think you should play the game. I think you should be a good citizen and do the right thing. And that's why I, I don't complain. Um, yeah, it's a bit of an inconvenience. Make the most of it. It's not like we're in a war or anything like that. You know, we're, we're comfortable. We're, we're, we're okay. Boy, it's changed the world, hasn't it, though? I mean, it's... It has. It has. So will we want to go on a ship again? And we mentioned this before we came on air. Um, a lot of people are saying, well, why would you want to get on a ship? It's just a big incubation box where someone gets it and everybody else gets it later on. But funnily enough, the cruise industry in Australia, according to the news reports, and who knows whether they're right or not, but they're saying that the cruise industry has had a... A, a swamping of bookings. Everybody wants to go on a ship cruise or, for whatever reason. So it seems that the cruise industry is alive and well. All they've got to do is get permission from the respective governments to, to go again. In Australia, we, you know, we, we're still not allowed out of the country. Well, I guess you are allowed out of the country. I don't think, but you know, travel is definitely greatly restricted. So, uh, and if you come back into the country, well, you've definitely got those two weeks in isolation to, uh, to play with. We've never had this kind of invisible enemy that could just pop up and you know, no, you, right. your ship, the Mortimer, you know, made national, international headlines all over the place because, you know, we were keeping track of you guys because, you know, you're stuck off the coast of Uruguay. And yeah, I mean, there's been good news and bad news. There's been positive press. There's been negative press. So it's been been quite interesting and been privy to a little bit of the behind the scenes. Uh, I look at Aurora Expeditions who ran it, and there are certainly people who are disgruntled. But overall, I think they did a fantastic job in looking after the passengers and looking after the crew. They certainly tried, and that you can't fault them for. So, you know, 100% for, for giving it, giving, no, it, giving it their all to getting us back safe and sound. At least that's behind you now, and, you know, you're moving forward. And, uh, you know, we're going to do another one of these chats somewhere along the line where we can talk a little bit more about positive things such as, you know, photography and technique. I think it should be positive because, you know, there's no point being negative uh because what, what, what's the point yeah you know, so we'll humans are an incredibly resourceful race and we will find a way through this so that i'm very sure whether we do it in two months two years or 20 years i'm not quite too sure hopefully not 20 years but yeah you know, it might take a couple of years to get back to where we were but along the way there'll be a lot of fun stuff happening as well so uh, i think we'll be all right so, you know, you wouldn't do anything different then, huh? You're, you, you just... I mean, I, I wouldn't have gone to Antarctica the second time if I knew I had 30 days of purgatory, no. Although, then again, as I said, I've got a lot of stuff done. So, there's no, no hard feelings at all. Um, it might, life, life's great. So, how we get through the rest of it, that's a little bit of a challenge at the moment, but there's a way. So, I mean, I'm like you. I've, yeah, I've got my online um, courses. I've got the magazine, which I still do. I... I'm going to do a big push to try and turn that into get more online subscribers because I, I think we've come to a time where I mean, people come along to your website because they could Google all of this sort of stuff if they knew what to ask. Yeah. But why they come to people like you and me is because we come up with ideas that we present to them and it only takes one idea from us or from other people from another source to give a photographer maybe the impetus to do a whole new project or a whole new way of looking. Yep. And so I'm really big in trying to get people to revert back to the idea of having an editor or an aggregator of interesting ideas that are presented to you. And so I think the idea of a magazine has still got currency, even though we've got access to Google. I mean, you look at a magazine, there's an idea there, and that's when you go and use Google to further research that idea. But the magazine becomes that source because Unless you've got ideas, we don't have good photos. Uh, you know, you can see that every one of the magazines is here. And well, why I like the magazine format, like a, you know, your magazine in particular, is because I don't have to sit at a computer and look at it, you know, right away. I mean, I can, you know, put it on this and say, I'll, I'll read this on the next airplane flight, or I can sit on, on the chair on Sunday morning with my coffee and, you know, read an article and enjoy it that way. Um, I'll put uh, Peter's uh, links for his magazine, Better Photography. 
That's really an exceptional magazine. And Peter, you're involved with a lot of other things too, like judging and competitions and all sorts of, of things. Um, very, very passionate uh, uh, gentleman. And As are you, young Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Anyway, I could keep going on and on, but I just want to say, you know, thank you, Peter, for uh, the, the conversation. Happy you're back, healthy and sound. Uh, we've both been through our COVID experiences that we'll all get through this. We'll all find a better side of things in the end. And uh, it's just kind of hard to, to see where that is right now. Yes, you know, keep them, keep them crossed. Anyway, thanks, Peter. And uh, for all my readers and visitors and viewers, thank you very much for being part of this. Uh, really appreciate you being part of the PXL family where we're trying to enhance your vision. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Ciao.